So, in my last video, talking about the TV series Pose, I made a throwaway comment praising the show for having hardly any white people in it, and a few people got very upset by that. Hardly any, to be fair, like two the last time I checked, the rest did the bare minimum of not getting offended by nothing. That video wasn't really about race, it was about landlords. Yet, some people still managed to run away with the idea that I'd said whiteness sucks. Which I hadn't. I can. I will. It does. But I hadn't. White people. I'm not racist against white people. I have white friends. I even have two white partners who do all of my cooking and cleaning, ostensibly because I'm disabled, but really, this is something every person of colour should have if they want it. Look, the reason I can say these things and that you shouldn't be offended by them is because racism against white people is not a thing that exists structurally. And frankly, even using this term on an individual level creates a false equivalence between oppressing someone and resenting one's oppressor. There are plenty of legitimate reasons to dislike whiteness and to be wary of white people. You don't have a great track record. So if any of this is triggering a kind of defensive response in you, the desire to correct me immediately in the comments, this video is probably too advanced and you need to go and learn how structural racism works first. I have recommended Rennie Edo Lodge's book before and I probably will keep doing so forever. It's in audiobook format too. Just, just, just give it a try. See how you feel. Come back to this afterwards, okay? For everyone who's still here, let's discuss the context in which our media currently exists. Western society exists, along with the closely linked systems of capitalism and patriarchy, under white supremacy. Simply put, this benefits white people at non-white people's expense. It exists in the form of overt racism, but also in subtle, pervasive forms that affect every aspect of our daily lives. Without us even noticing unless we pay close attention, this kind of soft racism affects our perceptions of what is good and what is normal. In media, we don't just see racism playing out in the form of racial stereotyping, we see it in the absence of non-white people. This leaves us with the white default, the assumption that any given character is white unless otherwise stated. Stories mostly feature and focus on white characters. People of colour, if they are there at all, are usually confined to background or supporting roles. A person of colour's performance in a lead role is usually only appreciated if that film is very specifically about race. We are so used to the white default that we really notice on the rare occasions that white people are absent. Not only notice, but sometimes we freak the fuck out like half the UK did when Sainsbury's featured a black family in their Christmas advert. White people are so used to being centred that not being included for one second is perceived as oppression. White people are also just not used to sympathising with people who don't look like them, they haven't had to. People of colour, on the other hand, grow up primarily sympathising with white characters, otherwise we wouldn't be able to enjoy media. Again, it is not possible to discriminate against white people when it comes to representation. We would have to make people of colour the default for at least several hundred years to make up for the past several hundred of oppressive whiteness to get to the point where we're even even. So please think about that, and I mean really think about that. I'm talking every superhero, every Disney princess, every Oscar nominee. How would you feel if almost none of them were white? Because that's the reality for people of colour, and like all people of colour, versus just white people. So clearly we have a problem. Representation, both on screen and behind the scenes, plays an important role in giving people of colour a voice and teaching white people to see us as people. But it's not as simple as just having more characters of colour when we live under a system that functions in part due to our oppression. It's a bit complicated, and there are certain pitfalls that even well-meaning media creators tend to fall into when including characters of colour. Rebranding. So lately, there's been a bit of a trend where whenever there's a remake or a new version of something, they will reimagine characters with marginalised identities, as in they will give them marginalised identities. So, for example, Black Hermione in that Harry Potter play, and uh, Black Ariel in Disney's beloved series of live-action remakes. And this is an okay thing to do, we need representation and this is that, but it's not the best representation by any means. It's very lazy and 
controversial on purpose. See, if a brown person suddenly shows up where a white audience didn't expect them to be, the backlash can be very intense even when it's a brand new character. Take Nessa from the Pokemon series, for example. People resisted this character's inclusion. Many lightened her skin in their fan arts, some chud even went so far as to create a fully whitewashed hack to replace her in-game. Again, this was not a previously white character. Nessa's design included dark brown skin from the start. So when a character is OG white in the minds of the general public, this reaction ramps up by a thousand. People go, I'm not racist, she's just supposed to be white. This is PC culture gone mad. Imagine if it was the other way round and make fan art of the original design. Progressives jump in to correct them and say, actually, that's not the same thing and here's why and make fan art of the new design. And with all of this discourse and art-based warfare, the film gets a lot of free publicity. Disney does the bare minimum and profits from controversy which is made all the worse when you consider that it's real people of colour who have to deal with the racist slurs and abuse from angry fans every time this happens. Real people who have to contend with the suffering and trauma it causes. I'm not saying reimagining characters as people of colour is a bad thing, support it if you want to, but it's not enough. It's not treating people of colour in the same way as white ones, it's treating them as a gimmick or an afterthought. True representation means making new characters of colour, not just getting your old white ones out the cupboard, dusting them off and then giving them a paint job. New stories are where we should focus most of our attention. The fear of making people of colour human. Now that that's out the way, let's talk about some issues with original characters of colour. Some are very obvious, well-known ones, such as always playing supporting roles, or playing comic relief roles, or racial stereotypes, or in the case of black people, dying within the first five minutes. But there are also some slightly more subtle ones. Let's start with Shira. One opinion I have about this show is that the bad characters, including the ones that are only bad temporarily, are a lot more complex and well-developed than the good ones. And this reflects interestingly in how they've distributed the people of colour. Let's see, on the good side we have Bo, who's nice and likes his friends, we've got Mermista, who's standoffish and likes mystery novels, and we've got this person who's a lesbian, I guess. Now on the other side, with all the interesting characters. Catra was the only one I read as a person of colour upon watching, but apparently Shadow Weaver has a black voice actor, so there's a case for her too. Although. Is this represented visually? I mean, she's kind of grey? What does that mean? The question of whether a voice actor's race is the race of a character is its own whole discussion, which I'm not going to go into too much detail right now. Um, personally, I think that it is a factor, but it's not the only one, otherwise you know what's going on here. What is clear is that Shadow Weaver, along with Catra and her ambiguous light skin design, are much more up for interpretation than the other characters. The bad, interesting POC are not obviously and visibly brown, only the good, boring ones are. The Umbrella Academy also suffers from boring brown people, but this time there's no good versus evil issue, the characters just suck. Ben is dead and spends most of his time being a kind of imaginary friend to Klaus, not much more to say there. Alison is a little bit more interesting, I guess on account of being alive, but even then she doesn't seem to have much personality of her own. Almost all of her character arcs revolve around her personal relationships, despite the fact that she's like a movie star or something and by nature of that job should have some other stuff going on. Instead, her entire shtick in the first season is worrying about her daughter, worrying about this guy, and worrying about this guy. In the second season, she's fighting for civil rights and worrying about this guy, and we do get to see some character development, but she's still kind of sidelined in a weird way. One scene really stuck out to me where she and Klaus get drunk together. He is allowed to vent on screen about how bad things are for gay people and his heartbreak and his trauma, but she just has to sit there and listen. We don't get to see her say anything to her white siblings, we don't see them support her. And then there's Diego, who's the most obviously flawed and also the most white passing of the three. So again, same thing as in Shira of the more ambiguous characters being the ones who are allowed to have moral failings. I should mention that in the second season, which is obviously trying to do better at race, we also get this lass who 
I can't really talk about too much because of spoilers, so I'm just gonna say she's okay. I don't know, I mean an accent isn't a personality. It's not that there's nothing there character-wise, but because of the nature of this character's motivations, we're not really gonna be able to judge her as a character in her own right until the third season. Again, as with She-Ra, the obviously brown characters are not the only ones who are slightly two-dimensional, but the point is that all of them are. These are just random examples in shows I happen to have watched over the last couple of years. And the pattern is that when writers aren't sidelining people of colour or making them racial stereotypes, they seem to have this tendency to make them boring. Like good and flawless, or flawed in this very noble, equally bland sort of way, and it's just dull. I guess it would still work sometimes if that character's conflict drove the plot, or they had a significant impact on the other major characters, but most of the time they don't. These characters are largely forgettable, and it seems that the more obviously of colour a character is, the more likely they are to fall into this kind of boring good category. Not always, of course, but it is a problem. So what's going on? There are two possible explanations. The first, slightly less charitable one, is that white supremacy trains everybody, actually, but particularly white people, to view people of colour as ultimately less than human. Therefore, they struggle to write people of colour as three-dimensional people because that's not how we're truly perceived. You can especially see this in the trope of black people in particular being cast as animals, plants, or inanimate objects. A black person is technically included, but their blackness is made invisible and we'll come back to that later. But the second is people who are on the flip side of this. People who are socially conscious, or at least aware that their audience might be. They may revert to these floppy cardboard cutout characters out of a fear of misrepresentation or stereotyping. If we go back to Shira, we can see how some of these decisions might have been made, consciously or not. Especially seeing how seemingly well-meaning, but very white, the writing room was. Putting all the obviously brown people on the good side, letting only ambiguous or unclear ones be villains, means they cover their backs against potential accusations of negative stereotyping. But there's a solution to this problem besides only allowing light-skinned or grey people of colour to have a personality and that's called having more of them. This was a real issue I had with the Umbrella Academy just by itself. Like, the premise is that 43 children with magical powers are spontaneously born around the world, this guy goes around acquiring custody of as many as he can, and the seven that he gets look like this? Interesting coincidence considering the world's population demographics. Yes, you can justify this with other in-universe reasons if you want to, you can use in-universe reasons to justify anything, you want to miss the point and go off in the comments, be my guest. What I'm trying to say is that, in the real world, we need more people of colour on our screens, and this was the perfect opportunity to have a majority non-white cast. But nope, we've got three people of colour, one of whom is already dead at the start of the series! If more of this cast had been people of colour, exactly the same characters, nothing else changed, it just wouldn't have had this problem, and while we're at it, they could have flipped a couple more of the genders too without significantly changing anything. And as for she in my opinion, it already has enough obvious people of colour that we could have had obvious bad people of colour with no problems. The reality is that if Catra or Shadow Weaver had been given more obviously non-white traits, it likely wouldn't have come across as stereotyping because we've also got all these boringly good people of colour on the other side. The incidental ideal versus when it hits different. When it comes to writing marginalised characters of any kind, you obviously want to put the character's personhood first. You can really tell when a character is defined by the writer's ideas of that character's gender, sexuality, or race. Like, you can tell when they're being written to be that thing. Like, the first time I remember ever really noticing the white default for myself was watching The Incredibles, and uh, it just suddenly hit me, like, why do they have to be a white family? Like, why does the main family have to be white? It's like it was never, it was never even an option for them to not be white. Or, or even for some of them to not be white. Like, you could have had a mixed race family, you know? Um, and, and, and Frozone was so obviously written in to just be the black sidekick. Like, he was 
That like that's why he was made. That that was why he was black. I didn't intend to put that bit in the script. It just sort of occurred to me just now, and I just just felt like saying it. So anyway, what I was getting at is that basically what you want ideally is for characters to just be people and to be their traits incidentally. However, if the impact of a character's race is not considered at all, that can throw up other problems. Again, in my opinion, race doesn't always absolutely have to be addressed. For example, in some fantasy and science fiction settings where um, humans might have a different history to what they do in the real world, and uh, they, they might they might cohabit with other alien races. There might be alien racism. I you know there's there's loads of there's loads of reasons why you might decide not to explore race in a topic, and I think it can work. But in most cases, people of color can't be shoved into just anything without a bit of extra thought. On one hand, we have the colorblind casting issue of Hamilton and Bridgerton, where people of color are swapped into white roles as if their skin color is of no consequence. This kind of ahistorical reimagining is not particularly valuable, in my opinion. I think it's escapism at best, and a weird form of whitewashing at worst. In Hamilton's case, people of colour actually play their own oppressors, while the narratives of black and indigenous people who were really there are completely ignored. Black and brown people are largely erased from most popular depictions of the Victorian era, but again, they were there. And it would be so much more meaningful to see those stories finally told, rather than simply recasting whiteness and calling it representation. On the other hand, you have the issue where the same plot might send out a very different message if a white person is replaced with a person of colour. Navigating the arena with soul. So earlier I mentioned the trope of black people tending to play non-human characters. A particular variant on that is when a human character, a previously human character, is turned into a non-human form for the majority of the film. We've seen this with the princess and the frog, spies in disguise, and most recently, Pixar's soul. However, Soul doesn't suffer from this trope in the same way as its predecessors, despite going hard on it. Not only is Joe a blue blob for large portions of the film, but he also spends a lot of time in the body of a cat, while an unborn soul, called 22, inhabits his original human body. There are reasonable narrative reasons as to why these transformations are necessary or useful, I think. The soul form provides a distinction between realms and a way to practically represent 22, while the body swap allows them to experience the world through a human lens, while Joe is able to appreciate his own life again from a different perspective. But in-universe reasons aside, this still could have been a really frustrating premise for Pixar's first film with a black lead if they hadn't handled it in the way they did. It's still not not frustrating given the inherent level of deracialization that comes with the plot. Despite that, this film overall doesn't shy away from Joe's blackness, or critically blackness in general. It does the opposite, and it does so with a refreshing everyday simplicity. We've seen animated films that celebrate non-white cultures respectfully, Moana for example. But Soul is unusual in that it focuses on people of colour without making their race central to the plot or neutralising it entirely. This isn't to say that media focused on race or specific cultures is bad, it obviously has its place. But people of colour don't just exist in faraway places that can be categorised and othered in the white subconsciousness. We're people who live right here beside you, and deserve to be depicted for no reason other than that. But when writing characters like this, thanks to the white default, most people think of characters as either POC or normal. So if race isn't the focal point of the story, many struggle to write people of colour without basically writing white characters that look like POC. Because this is what we interpret to be ordinary, when whiteness defines what ordinary is. Race is either the sole reason for a character's existence, or it's absolutely irrelevant, there is no in-between. But soul depicts the reality of race for most people in the West, it is our normal. It's part of us, but it's not all we are. Joe is introduced to jazz by his dad as black music, showing the cultural significance it has to him. He makes a throwaway comment asking 22 why they sound like a middle-aged white lady, which is not an observation most white characters would make. His family is black, his social circles are mostly black, and he goes to a black barber. 
Things like this don't dominate or even affect the plot, but they show the ways that Joe's race is a part of who he is. And that's doing more than just getting around the blue blob issue. It's portraying people of colour simply and fully as people. And commonplaces that should be, watching this sharply highlighted to me that I have never seen that before in an animated production of this scale. Soul comes across as a story that its creators wanted to tell, but were acutely aware of how this story would come across differently with a black character instead of a white one. The basic outline of this story doesn't require a black character to tell it. They could have avoided this scenario altogether by making Joe white. Instead, they did exactly what they should have done, and rolled with it with a care and awareness both behind the scenes and on screen that is reflected in the final product. In conclusion, we could keep going with this analysis and find things that the film didn't portray so well. For example, since they had a non-black person being dropped into a black person's body, they kind of passed up on the opportunity to show everything that that would entail. But 22 has a great time on Earth, no problems whatsoever. Like a black person could actually run around being this wacky in public with no consequences. In reality, 22 would have some experiences that would probably make them think twice about coming to Earth after all. You could definitely argue that not acknowledging this means not fully acknowledging the reality of being a black person. At the same time, you could argue that it's really refreshing to have a film that is about black people that isn't about black suffering. Ultimately, no one film can say everything that needs to be said, and I think that's really the crux of the matter when it comes to the representation of people of colour. Especially considering that these groups are so large and so underrepresented. There is no one perfect representation that will please everybody, even within marginalised groups we worry about what other members of that group will think of our work. Criticism is just part of the nature of making anything that gets seen by a lot of people. So rather than shying away from that, I think people need to embrace marginalised identities and simply learn to consider and grow from criticism. Not doing so is really just an excuse for our exclusion to continue. And the more that the variety we have on screen resembles the diversity of real life, the less every individual depiction will matter. I hope Soul sets a precedent. I hope people don't see it and think, ah, a black film racism is over, but rather see how much it highlights the need for more films like it. We need more people willing to do the work that went into that, doing the research, learning the history, bringing in people with relevant experience to work on the project, ensuring that there's representation in the direction and writing as well as the cast, with an awareness of how things may be perceived differently with characters that aren't the cisgender, heterosexual, white male default. It sounds like a lot, but really it's just a lot of common sense. And if Soul has shown us anything, it's that so long as there's integrity and decency in a project's creation, then navigating the patterns and pitfalls of including people of colour in stories is really not that difficult. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I talked about Soul a lot in this video, um, I just kind of want to say some stuff that isn't necessarily relevant to the rest of the video here, so because the video, the video is officially over and now I can just ramble or whatever. I think Soul is a really important film for more reasons than just doing race good, um, and if you want to learn more about that I would suggest uh, watching a video which will pop up in one of these corners uh, by uh, YouTuber Anansi who is just wonderful and you should check out their channel if you haven't already and you should also definitely watch this film because it will make your life better. Special thanks to my coffee supporters whose names will be coming up on screen. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say. I just always end my videos in this really awkward way because I just don't know how else to do it. Um, actually I do have other stuff to say. Apparently past me didn't want to see any channel growth from this video or to get paid. If you enjoyed this video, please consider becoming a monthly supporter over on my coffee, or alternatively, liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing is all incredibly useful too. Extra big thank yous to Anansi for proofreading this script and to Hazel as usual for assistance with filming. Social media links are in the description and now I am done.